get started. I have 6.30 on my watch. Uh, I am, hi, welcome tonight. I am Kara. I am the adult services librarian next door at the library. And I'm also on the board of the Historical Society. So I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight. Uh, we have the Historical Society is over on Lincoln Street, and it has a museum um, with some hours <laughs> each week. Um, there is a brochure up here if you have more questions or information needs for the Historical Society. And then here is our agenda tonight. We will be talking about Miss Oregon, then the history of the library. <coughs> then we'll be talking about historical artifacts and what they are. Uh, and then we'll, we'll finish with remembering Jerry Mead. So, Miss Oregon, take it away. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Pat Anderson Wilkening, and I have been asked to speak to you about the history of the first Miss Oregon pageant. I believe that I was chosen to speak because I was the first Miss Oregon, well, almost the first. There was at least one contest that was a popularity event held during the Depression that the community cast votes for women who signed up, crowning the winner the Oregon Queen. Pictured here is Miss Clarice Qualley, chosen Queen of Oregon, 1933, along with her attendants, Catherine Clark and Mary Ann Mannion. The name was changed from Queen to Miss Oregon the following year. The picture on the right is Carla Christensen, Miss Oregon, 1984, the very first Oregon Queen's granddaughter. How exciting that must have been. In 1966, the village of Oregon was celebrating its 125th anniversary. The Oregon Chamber of Commerce decided that they would sponsor the Miss Oregon pageant and select someone who would serve as their official hostess at chamber-sponsored events, both locally and in the area. This was the first pageant to be held in a small community to 1993. Norm Champion was the chamber president at that time and Marv Jensen was the chairman of the entrance committee for the 1966 pageant. Girls in the Oregon School District were encouraged to fill out an application to participate in the pageant. Entry blanks were available from any chamber member at school and also at local businesses. The applicants had to be between the ages of 16 and 21, single, never married, divorced, or had a marriage annulled. They had to be girls of good character, possessed poise, personality, intelligence, charm, and beauty of face and figure. I <laughs> chuckle at that wording. The contestants could be of either amateur or professional status. They would be required to perform a three-minute talent or routine. They must also agree to be available for all chamber functions. The reign of Miss Oregon the first year was from June 1, 1966 to June 1, 1967. All judges' decisions would be final. Judges were chosen by the pageant committee. Some had experience with other pageants, including the Miss Wisconsin pageant. Jim Cannon was the general chairman for the Miss Oregon contest. 18 entries were received for the first pageant. The 18 applicants were judged privately to determine the top 10 contenders. The 10 selected co contestants would participate in evening gown and talent competitions. Before the crowning of Miss Oregon, each contestant would select a random question to be answered on the spot and then critiqued by the judges before the winner was announced. The bios of the 10 contestants were printed in the Oregon Observer. Butler Delaney is to be credited with the excellent promotion and coverage of the pageant. After looking over the bios recently, it seemed that the heights ranged from 5 feet to 5 feet 8 inches, 
and everyone weighed just about the same, 130 pounds. <laughs> I wonder if you'd get away with printing that today in the paper. <laughs> there was a nice array of talents. Piano and vocal solos, orations, comedy and dance routines, dress designing, as well as a sewing and modeling demonstration. It was a wonderful evening of entertainment. There were many advantages to participating in the pageant. All contestants received a series of lessons on grooming and posture. Bon Don's Beauty Salon provided hairstyles for each of the finalists, and Vivian Woodward <laughs> provided makeup tips. There was a nice, uh, let's see. First prize was a $200 scholarship to any accredited school, $100 for each semester. There would be some money provided for formal and street clothes. All event expenses would be paid and a chaperone was provided for all events. Prizes of a $75, $50, and $25 savings bond would be given to the runners-up. The remaining girls each received $10 cash prize. <laughs> if I remember correctly, each of the 10 finalists also received a charm with Miss Oregon Pageant 1966 engraved on it. I'm assuming that my lucky number was six because I was fortunate enough to take home the title of the very first Miss Oregon. Such a privilege and what an honor. The crown that I wore that evening was designed and made by David Logan. He was the high school art teacher at that time. It was very heavy. It was made of metal and had a gem at its peak. They changed that later on. Miss Oregon represented the community in Summerfest and other local parades and she would help to welcome new businesses into the community. If for some reason Miss Oregon was unable to attend an event, the first alternate would step in to assist. For me, that would be our very own Annetta Kopke Powell. I had the honor of presenting, along with other chamber members, a booster button to Governor Knowles to help kick off the publicity campaign for the 125th anniversary celebration. I also had the privilege of working with the Oregon community when hosting Wisconsin's largest regional Alice in Dairyland contest. Quite the event with a parade and meals for 60 entries. Before leaving for college, I was asked along with Miss Oktoberfest to fly around the state with Governor Knowles promoting the state of Wisconsin. I had on the one dress that I had not shipped off to my college destination. Unfortunately, I was the only Miss Oregon to attend the Miss Wisconsin pageant. The cost turned out to be quite expensive for a small community, but it was an incredible learning experience for me. So many members of our community and businesses, as well as the Oregon School District, worked tirelessly to put on pageants throughout the years. As you can see, a lot of time and effort went into the planning production of the Miss Oregon pageants. Joanne Swenson, a current board member of the Oregon Area Historical Society, assisted with wardrobe in many of the pageants. It's in the book. <laughs> Ginny O'Brien put on incredible shows. She sang, danced, and choreographed routines. She was involved with the Madison Theater Guild and had many connections with vocalists and musicians from the Oregon and Madison area. Our own Jim Bosingham, for, former owner of BJ's Hair Salon, was often involved and treated us with his many talents. He was charming and the audience loved him. Our first pageant was attended by a sellout crowd of nearly 500 people. Ginny's entertainment, along with the pageant agenda, packed the Oregon High School Auditorium. Pauline McManus took over the pageant later on. She dedicated many years of time and effort to the Miss Oregon pageant. The pageant was scaled down and it became more about the women that would represent our community than entertainment. Pauline worked with the contestants on speaking and interviewing techniques. The pageants were held at a local supper club and talent portion was eliminated. The contestants needed then to be um, supported and sponsored by an area business. This slide shows the basic format for the Miss Oregon pageant. 
The contestants voted on a Miss Congeniality. Miss Congeniality is typically awarded to a contestant who is seen as the most friendly, approachable, and kind-hearted among the contestants. Miss Congeniality 1966 was Jackie Maloney Damson. Here's a list of all the girls that were fortunate enough to be crowned Miss Oregon. In 1993, to go along with the changing times, the contest was opened up to both male and female contestants. Corey Spink was chosen as Oregon's ambassador. Unfortunately, interest had been lost in the competition over time, and this turned out to be its last year. I've been in contact with a few of the former Miss Oregon's and would like to share some of their thoughts with you. Becky Bonkamp Grenier, Miss Oregon, 1982. I was Miss Oregon in 1982. I really enjoyed meeting so many people at various events I went to. Attending Oregon Summerfest was a highlight. It was a special year. Ginger Neath Zimberman, Miss Oregon, 1972. <clears throat> the first thing that comes to mind is my parents. From the crowning night throughout my journey, the pride on their faces. It was just as big for them as it was for me. Then 20 years later, for mom and dad to be with me for Tina's big night. Wow, just wow. Tina was Ginger's daughter. Tina Gefke Butchen, Miss Oregon, 1992. Jacqueline Garvel Kujawa, Miss Oregon, 1986. There are so many wonderful memories that I have from my reign as Miss Oregon, 1986. It's hard to put them all into a few sentences. I can still see my mom sitting in the convertible as my chaperone wearing her M-O-M hat that stood for Miss Oregon's mom. She was very proud of that hat, and I wouldn't be surprised if she has it tucked away somewhere. Being Miss Oregon 1986 allowed me the opportunity to serve as Oregon's ambassador. I was given the honor of representing the community that I loved at local parades, horse shows, business openings, community events, just to name a few. It helped prepare me for college, giving me confidence and poise, as I wasn't afraid of taking a public speaking class after having to speak in front of the audiences such as the Chamber of Commerce. I was a sophomore in high school when I was crowned Miss Oregon, and I think it made me appreciate those years even more. I feel like there will forever be a sisterhood among the former Miss Oregons. I remember the outpouring of community love I received from, um, let's see, excuse me, I received after being crowned. I thought to myself how fortunate I was to experience such support from people who I didn't even know. Here a farm kid from Brooklyn can live out her dreams, kind of like Cinderella. Deb Bosingham, Miss Oregon 1990. Miss Oregon has had a profound and lasting influence on my life, imparting invaluable lessons that continue to shape my journey. It has shaped my commitment to giving back to the community and to nurture its growth and prosperity. I was fortunate to witness the sesquicentennial celebration of Oregon, which allowed me to appreciate the rich history and the remarkable transformation Oregon has undergone over the past 150 years. Miss Oregon's impact on my life goes far beyond the crown, beyond the crown, as she exemplifies the spirit of dedication and the celebration of our heritage that continues to inspire me today. After completing my reign, I was fortunate enough to be able to read home, return home from college and participate in the crowning of the next Miss Oregon, Betty Hoffland. Miss Madison's and Miss Wisconsin's also participated in many of our coronations. I do remember a Miss Oregon reunion that was held at one of the local supper clubs. At a, as I was going through the line, one of the younger Miss Oregon said to me, 1966? That was the year I was born. <laughs> I remember getting a couple of jabs from my husband after witnessing <coughs> that comment. My husband, Al, and I returned to Wisconsin in 1972. In 1975, Al and I were asked to be a part of the planning production committee for the Miss Oregon pageants. The excitement and joy of working with talented contestants and community members continued on for several years. The programs that I have on the table represent those years. Being crowned Miss Oregon was a life-changing experience for me. I was sincerely honored and truly blessed to have the opportunity to represent this incredible village of Oregon. Thank you.
Some of us will sit, some of us will stand. <laughs> My name is Joel Olson, and I'm on the uh, volunteer crew at the museum. And so it's, uh, and I'm a fairly active patron over at the library. So when we were looking for topics, uh, this interested me very much. So this is a history of the Oregon Public Library. The year was 1910, and it was about time. The village of Oregon was 65 years old, and a handsome infrastructure was in place. Tree-lined streets, businesses, churches, schools, and the railroad, together with stately homes and humble dwellings, enhanced the lives of residents, numbering about 700 in 1910. After the Civil War, the nation experienced a, a couple of economic dips before the Industrial Revolution kicked into high gear, bringing prosperity to cities and villages alike throughout the land. The new, that is the 20th century, brought a self-consciousness and a new leisure to the masses. Many towns had opera houses like this, for local entertainment, maybe not the refined productions of Verde or Puccini, but traveling minstrels and down-home talent. People paid their nickel and their lives were enriched. And now people could find time to read. In the late 1890s, Oregon had a subscription library open to any who could pay a few dollars a year for the privilege to read books that somebody else had gathered together. Records show that about 35 families paid $3 for a five-year term, and then a large box of books came from Madison every three months to circulate among just those families. The arrangement was hardly de democratic, and before long, civic-minded civic women in this community put their wits together to develop a library which any and all residents of the village would be entitled to use. Mrs. Jean Bennett was one such soul who had this larger vision to establish a free public library in town. She put on her bonnet and headed to the local lumber yard and begged for several board feet of shelving. Wood in hand, she corralled some of the men lolling around in the village green to help assemble bookshelves. She found the front portion of the floor above the local drugstore. The room maybe was only 15 by 15 feet, had a couple of bookcases, a desk, and a chair. And soon it was able to boast about 1,400 books. When Mrs. Bennett had to pay $5 a month to rent the room, she went begging again. The local bowling alley donated all the proceeds taken in one day. And her lady friends at the Methodist Church gave a dinner of squirrel and rabbit <laughs> pie. I have it on pretty good authority that when our new library opens early next year on Alpine Parkway, the rabbits and squirrels in the neighborhood can rest easy. <laughs> the menu may be cheese and crackers or cake and coffee, but no pies of wild game will be in the building. Before speaking of a new library building, our humble beginnings stayed in upstairs quarters for several years. More accessible facilities became available when Oregon built its new village hall in 1941. 
And then in 1980, the library moved into the building we're now gathered in this evening, this end of Paul's supermarket. By 1995, the library building across the parking lot was built, and it has been bursting at the seams for 28 years now. Think of how the village has grown in the last century. 700 residents in 1910, about 10,000 on the population boards today. And in these last 115 years, the library has stayed true to its mission to support lifelong learning, to helping youth with their school-based assignments, and to offering general information through a host of services. Twice, though, there's been a significant disruption of those services. Local historian Floris Paulson wrote that in 1920, a scarlet fever epidemic, maybe about as bad as the influenza epidemic just a couple years before that time, caused widespread concern in the community. For these various health crises, schools and public facilities could be found closed from time to time. In Oregon, patrons who had library books at home were told to burn them to keep the contagion out of the library. Then exactly 100 years later, in 2020, the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic closed the library doors for over a year, up to 14 months. How many of us got used to ordering our books online, pulling into the parking lot and calling inside to announce our arrival, then wait in our cars until a masked employee placed our bag of books on the table outside? Only then could we retrieve them when said masked employee was safely indoors. In spite of the pandemic though, Many library services were able to continue, even expand in some new ways. Librarians were still employed here or at home. Books were still ordered and cataloged and available after only a few days of decontamination. Story time for little kids happened on Zoom. And the serious researchers could go to a dozen or more half a dozen and a half online sites. The teen advisory board very conveniently met on Zoom while all the adult groups seemed to struggle with Zoom when they tried to gather for a monthly meeting. So talk about technology changing life. Now most popular titles are available in electronic mode and the library staff will help you get set up on Libby to read a, vo a book on whatever device you choose, wherever you are. One such patron, a local resident here, who works in Costa Rica and regularly uses Libby from our library with her library card. For all of the new technology gigas, you just have to go to the library website. It's very user friendly. It'll show you what's new in outreach services. Again, all from the convenience of your computer at home. So early next year, the Oregon Public Library will move into its new quarters. The first library in town was up above a drugstore, and the new library will still have rooms upstairs. The first one was maybe about 300 square feet. The new one will be more than 30,000 square feet. There will be lots of rooms, separate spaces for meetings, for quiet study and reading, for kids' noisy activities, and for staff workspace. The first library paid $5 a month for rent. The new library will cost over $12 million to be built. In 1920, the total library expenses were about $500 for the year. The current annual budget is well over a million dollars a year. For several of the early years, 
The librarian was the only employee. Today, there are 20 full-time and part-time staff, professionals, paraprofessionals, and pages. About 7,800 village and township residents hold a library card, and they've checked out over 190,000 items last year. Since a library only owns 56,000 books and 14,000 audio and visual materials, a lot of those borrowed materials conveniently came from one of the other 60 libraries in the South Central Library System. 68,000 people walked through the doors of the library last year, and over 9,000 children and adults came in for one program or another. Today, public libraries have earned their place as a vital and valuable community resource. And yet, public libraries are always at the mercy of the public. Nationwide, about 85% of library funds come from taxes, and the bulk of that from local property taxes. Federal and state grants help a little, but more appreciated are donations, gifts of dollars, of material donations, and of volunteer time. So whenever you use the library yourself, Whenever you encourage your family and friends to take advantages of all the levels of family-related services, when you say an appreciative word to the staff, when you pay your taxes, and when you speak well of the library in our community, you are patriotically helping to maintain this unique democratic institution that is one of the bedrocks of our free American society. Our hats off to the staff of the Oregon Public Library for their consistently high level of community service. And thank you indeed. Museums come in all different shapes and sizes from small to large. Some are themed museums, such as the Norwegian Heritage Museum, that tells the story of Norwegian immigrants that came to a Wisconsin settlement that we know today as Stoughton, Wisconsin. There's the Kelch uh, Aviation Museum in Broadhead, Wisconsin, that has a wonderful display of 1920 and 1930 bi-wing aircrafts. And if you can believe it or not, there's even a mustard museum in Middleton, Wisconsin that has over 6,000 varieties of mustard from all 50 states and 70 countries. Many communities have historical societies like Oregon that also have a museum. And the museum tells the history and story of that community. But regardless of the type or size of museum, all museums collect artifacts that they display, preserve, or store. And the question might be, well, what is an artifact? How do museum, why do museums collect them? And how do they decide which ones to display? Let's look at an example of this particular item of a wooden box. Is this an artifact? Is it significant? Does it have any real value or is it historic? Well, let's see if we can address those questions in this presentation by offering a set of questions and see if we can answer them. So let's start with what is an artifact? Where do you find artifacts? What makes an artifact significant? What makes an artifact valuable? And what makes it historical? 
Well, an artifact is an object made by a human being, typically an item of culture or historical interest. Artifacts are human-made versus naturally made. Nature does a wonderful job of making a whole variety of different types of rocks, but a rock is a rock. But if somebody takes that rock or a stone and makes an arrowhead out of it, now it's an artifact since it was human-made. Next question. Where do we find artifacts? We find them everywhere. We find them at home, work, donation centers, estate sales, garage sales. We're surrounded by artifacts. But why do the museum collect some but not others? Well, what makes the artifact significant? It's a significant artifact if it's valuable, historical, unique, one of a kind, or has a story to tell. Next one. What makes an artifact valuable? A valuable artifact is one that has a high financial value, is rare, unique, one of a kind, such as artwork, jewelry, heirlooms, and so forth. A financially valuable artifact usually requires a provenance. A provenance is a record of ownership which is used to guide to authenticity or quality. An analogy would be a property deed. A property deed, a property deed is a written record of the ownership of property from the original owner through all the different owners to the, to the current or present owner. Museums and collectors of valuable artifacts generally require a provenance. Uh, before purchasing or displaying to prove the authenticity of the article. If you're paying thousands to millions of dollars for this artifact, you want to make sure it's an original and not a copy. In terms of historical artifacts, a historical artifact has at least one of the following. A written historical record, a first person record, or it tells a story. I like to upcycle. Upcycle means that I take things like a dresser or a desk or some wooden shutters and I'll take that dresser and I'll refresh it by giving it a new coat of paint and some new hardware. Or I'll take that desk and I'll make it into an island with coasters or wheels. Or I'll take the wooden shelves and make, uh, I'm sorry, take the wooden shutters and make a wooden shelf out of it. While browsing at a local garage store looking for something that I could upcycle, I came across this item, our wooden box. Just a wooden ordinary box, nothing out of the ordinary, but wooden boxes have an appeal to me. And so when I look at this wooden box, I don't just see a wooden box, I see a coffee table. And if you notice at the very bottom of the slide, you might be able to see the legs that I added to this. So I now have a coffee table with built-in storage. But when I took this box home and I started to clean it up and observe and look at it, I saw this in the next slide here, a leather patch on the end of one of the box. It's very stiff and hard, and it was held down by four roofing nails. And if I, when I cleaned it and looked a little closer, I saw the next slide. That this had embossed lettering on it that said packing list. And if you look very carefully, it's kind of hard to see, but on the outside of this, you could see that it was kind of swollen in the middle, indicating to me that there might actually be something underneath that leather pack. So of course, I'm a curious person. So I removed a couple of those nails and looked underneath, and this is what I found. Indeed, there was a manila envelope with a clasp, and that manila envelope actually says packing list. I thought, well, was there really a packing list inside? So now I looked inside the manila envelope, and I found this. <coughs> it's a sheet of paper in pristine condition. It wasn't uh, crumbly. It wasn't about to fall apart. The ink was fresh. It wasn't smeared or fading. It looked like this piece of paper had been placed in there the day before. So what did this piece of paper information, what kind of information did it give me? The first thing I noticed is in the upper left-hand corner, it says War Department Shipping Document. 
And if I look here on the document, I see a date of January 24th, 1946. This box is at least 77 years old. It's older than I am. I hard to believe it was in the condition that it was in. Next slide. What I then observed was that this box came from Camp Swift in Texas. And um, I thought, well, maybe I should research a little bit and see what, where was Camp Swift? What was that? So this is what Camp Swift looked like in 1940, in the 1940s. Next slide. Camp Swift is located in Bastrop, Texas, which is just outside of the uh, capital of Texas in Austin. It was built in 1941 as a training camp on 56,000 acres, consisting of 2,700 buildings, none of which exist today. During World War II, the camp held up to 90,000 GIs, making it one of the best, largest training and transshipment camps in Texas. When we say transshipment, that meant when they were done with their training, they were going overseas to fight a war. The camp uh, trained up to 300,000 soldiers before the war ended. During World War II, the camp held up to 10,000 German POWs, one of the largest uh, POW camps in the United States. A lot of people weren't aware of the fact that our military camps held prisoners of war. And as an aside, I thought, well, I was curious, what about Camp McCoy up in Sparta, Wisconsin? Well, at the end of the war, Camp McCoy had 3,000 German POWs, 2,700 Japanese POWs, and 500 North Korean POWs. The Camp McCoy uh, had the largest number of Japanese POW uh, POWs in the United States. Camp Swift still exists today, but it's only about one-fifth of its original size. Today, it's a military arms training center and the Texas National Guard training center. If we look at the next slide, we'll see that this was, uh, that box was sent to the United States Armed Forces Institute in Madison, Wisconsin was actually located on 102 North Hamilton, kind of conveniently located between the University of Wisconsin campus and the Madison Technical School in downtown Madison. Next slide. The Armed Forces Institute was an educational organization that was part of the Armed Forces. These were located throughout the United States and they operated from around 1942 to 1974, which would be about from the middle of World War II to about the end of the Vietnam War. And they provided educational opportunities, including GEDs, general examinations at the college level, and courses to service members. So the Armed Forces Institute assisted service members transitioning from the military service to civilian life. This box listed, or the paper in that mineral envelope, listed some of the training materials in the box. <clears throat> These included things like America's vocational schools, apprentice training for returning servicemen, handbook for servicemen and service women, special aids for placing military personnel in civilian jobs, vocational technical training for industrial occupations, working for the federal government, guide to college universities and professional schools in the U.S., educational advisory man manual. Based on my background in education and training, and based on the limited number of these items that were in the box, this tells me that these were the materials for the instructors that were doing the training. When I, I missed it at the beginning, but I went back then and looked again under that leather patch. There was a second manila envelope, also containing multiple sheets of paper. 
And those sheets of paper listed even more items that were in the box, consisting of leaflets, pamphlets, and booklets. Those, I suspect, were the materials that were actually given to those taking the training and transitioning from the service into civilian life. Well, this uh, artifact, along with its documented record, certainly is, gives us an interesting story. But, like most stories, historical stories, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Let's look at some of those. Where has this box been for 77 years? <laughs> Who had this box and what did they use it for? How did this box end up in a garage sale in Oregon, Wisconsin? Had anyone else looked under the leather patch to see if a packing list was present? If not, why not? And then that actually gave me one more question. Why didn't the people at the Armed Forces Institute in Madison, Wisconsin, remove that packing list when they received it? Why did it stay there? for 77 years. So let's take our box and address those questions that we started with at the beginning. Is this box an artifact? Well, obviously, it's human made. So yes, it meets our definition of an artifact. Where is this box found? Remember, we can find artifacts anywhere. This one came from a garage sale in the Oregon area. <coughs> Is this box a significant artifact? The box in and of itself is not significant. There were probably hundreds of thousands of these boxes made during World War II and used by the military. But the sheer fact that it's still here 77 years later makes it a significant artifact. And now we add to that we have a documented record of when and where it came from and where it went to and what it contained, it indeed is a significant artifact. Is it a valuable artifact? Well, again, not really. It's no more worth than the few dollars I paid to buy it. But, again, because of its recorded record and the story it gives us, it indeed is valuable. And lastly, is this a historical article, artifact? Again, with a documented written uh, history and with the story that we are able to derive, this clearly is a historical article. You begin to see some overlap here. If it's a significant artifact, it's significant because generally it's either valuable or historic. If it's historic, it can also be valuable and vice versa. Next slide. So this 77-year-old box was an item in with, that, with documentation about where it came from and for what purpose it was used. It tells the story of the materials that were being sent from Camp Swift to Madison in 1946. And it provided associated information about Camp Swift and the United States Armed Forces Institute. In summary, using our wooden box as an example, we now know what an artifact is, where to find them, and what makes them significant, valuable, and historic. You can learn a lot by visiting museums, looking at their displayed artifacts, and learn stories about these, what these artifacts have to tell. If you've not had the opportunity to visit the uh, Oregon Historical Museum, I recommend that you do so, and you look at the artifacts that they have and learn the stories about the history and origins of Oregon, Wisconsin. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Joanne Swenson, and tonight I have the privilege of sharing with you a few memories of Gerald Jerry Neath. As I read through this as I read through this presentation, you will also see that Jerry loved his family, his country, 
his church, and the Oregon community. He served his country through service in the U.S. Army from 1962 through 1964. Those were the only two years that he did not live and work in Oregon. Jerry was a person of deep faith and a love and dedication to his family. He also loved classical music and history, and especially that of his family's heritage. Jerry did not seek attention. He did not aspire to accolades. Jerry was just steadfast in the things that were important to him, his family, his faith, his country, the community, his friends, and his coworkers. Jerry was born on February 4th, 1939. He passed away on August 12th, 2023. He was the oldest son of Eldon and Catherine Neath. He was a loving husband to Jeannie for over 37 years, a caring stepfather to Jennifer and her family, and a beloved older brother to Rick and Larry. So let's look at some of the many contributions that Jerry made to our community. Jerry graduated from Oregon High School, the Red Brick as we know it, in 1958. Even though Jerry and I attended high school for many of the same years, I don't believe that we ever shared the same classes. But I do have a particular remembrance of Jerry during our years in high school. Jerry played the tuba in the high school band, and he'd practice in the band room after school. The band room at that time was just across the hall from the gymnasium, and I recall hearing Jerry practice while the girls' teams played volleyball or basketball in the gym. Later on, of course, Jerry tooted the tuba in the Zora Shrine Band. Jerry actually started his banking career in 1957 while he was still in high school. Working in the bookkeeping department, he was one of just seven employees of the bank at that time. Others were Owen Richards, Earl Wheeler, Al Gasner, Vera Putnam, Marion Owen, and Lila Urban. When I graduated two years later, I too became employed at the Bank of Oregon and joined Jerry in the bookkeeping department. During those early years at the bank, the bank opened promptly at 9 a.m., closed exactly at 3 p.m., and we closed for one hour at noon. Bankers hours, you say? Well, not really. For the employees, we worked from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day and from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Friday nights. And at year end, it was mandatory that we cut a statement for each depositor's account. So everyone worked on New Year's Eve and also on New Year's Day to complete that task. We had some good times too. Like the time Mr. Richards reported his car stolen from the parking lot. The local police searched and found that he had actually just taken it to the garage for an oil change. <laughs> We look forward to the days when Mr. Richards and Mr. Wheeler clerked at the farm auctions. We closed the bank at 3 p.m. and Vera Putnam would take our orders for ice cream treats from Schrader's drugstore down the street and we'd enjoy them while we finished up our day's work. Back then, all social security checks were received on the third of the month. We all knew that that day would be an especially busy one. So we set out treats for the customers, for coffee and milk and and homemade cookies, bars, or cake. Even when most of the Social Security recipients signed up for a direct deposit, they still came to the bank for the treats. <laughs> most of them just said they wanted to check to see if the deposit was actually in their account. Of course it was, but they still came month after month to check and to enjoy the treats. When computerization came to the bank, it did have a big impact on the bookkeeping department inasmuch as it eliminated a good share of the manual record keeping. But it also opened opportunities in other areas of the bank. So Jerry and I became tellers or worked in other customer service functions available at the bank. Jerry went on to enjoy a successful 45 year career in banking. Even when electric, electric typewriters came into the picture, Jerry would often rely on his old favorite manual typewriter so upon his retirement, the bank gifted that typewriter to him. Another facet of Jerry's contribution to the Oregon community was through his affiliation and membership in the Presbyterian Church. He was a lifetime member there. He served as a church elder, 
was the church treasurer for many years and sang in the church choir. Jerry had a special attachment to the Rutland Center Church. His ancestors, the DeJane family, were early settlers in the Rutland area, and some of them are buried in the, in the cemetery adjacent to the church. Jerry worked with the Restoration Committee, in which he wrote a comprehensive history of the church and the cemetery. He was one of over 100 volunteers taking part in a 10-year restoration program of that church. But most of all, I remember Jerry for his membership in the Oregon Area Historical Society. Did you know that Jerry was a charter member of the organization? In fact, he served on the interim board of directors that was elected to facilitate the organization of the Historical Society. The, the Oregon Area Historical Society received its charter on January 13, 1988. Those early years of its existence were filled with many memorable milestones. 1989 saw their dream of having a museum become a reality, thanks to the generosity of Lars Paulson, who purchased the then vacant Chase Lumber Company warehouse on West Lincoln Street and donated it to the society. With that began an intensive renovation program of the building led by the famous self-proclaimed wrecking crew who consisted of Bob Keenan, Max Gafke, Stan Gafke, and Wes Wethel. The official dedication of the museum took place on May 18, 1991, with Lyman Anderson as the keynote speaker. The event included a tour of Oregon historic homes that was organized by Sue Ames. The Historical Society took part in Summerfest parades, held their first ice cream social in 1993, participated in Maxwell Street Days, held rummage sales, and sponsored card parties at the Oregon Senior Center as fundraising events to enable the continuing improvements to the building and the grounds. 1998 brought a major celebration as Wisconsin's sesquicentennial marking the state's 150th birthday. <coughs> the Oregon Area Historical Society formed a sesquicentennial committee chaired by Phil Peterson to develop ways to recognize the significant milestone in Wisconsin's history. Jerry served on the committee, assisting with the project to place markers at all of the old rural school sites in the Oregon School District. From the rural school project, a book was published featuring the rural schoolhouses and a brief history of the school. Another event relating to the rural schools was a tour to the Dogtown School, where Betty Manson, dressed as a pioneer school teacher, gave a presentation on classes, how classes were conducted in the one-room rural schoolhouse. It was also the introduction of Flores' book, A Walk Back in History. This book still serves as a resource for historical short stories about Oregon's history. Oregon, Wisconsin's sesquicentennial was a major project, and yes, Jerry was there to help. Jerry returned to serve on the Board of Directors, serving from 1999 through 2001, and was elected again to serve from 2008 through 2013. During that time, he was elected treasurer for six years. I guess all of his experience in banking obviously made him a logical candidate for the position. The Tuesday Crew. In the early years of the Oregon Area Historical Society, Eda Lumley and Janet Keenan were the primary caretakers of the museum. They did it all from taking in donations of articles, record keeping, setting up displays, being available for tours of the museum, answering questions, etc., etc. The list would go on and on. They took care of it all. Jerry Neath, along with Melanie Woodworth, Ann Morris, and Jean Doty, and Jean Doty stepped up to help with the task when Health concerns made it necessary for Ida and Janet to curtail their time at the museum. They were there to keep things going. They became the original Tuesday crew, who were there every Tuesday to open the museum to the public and to tend to the tasks needed at the museum. I don't know when the Tuesday crew label came into being, but it stuck, and today we still call our group of volunteers the Tuesday crew. In the years that followed, the group grew Dixie Brown, Mary Norwell, Pete Manderfield, Joel Olson, Heather Young, Carol Wickman, myself, became part of the group. But Jerry was an integral part of the Tuesday crew. He was most often seen 
paging through the editions of the Oregon Observer in search of interesting articles found in years 10, 25, 50, and even 100 years ago. Initially, he would handwrite those passages on a yellow legal pad before typing his notes at home. And later, he had a handheld scanner that he used to record them before he typed the final report and submitted it to the observer. It was, and still is, a time-consuming effort. But from all indications, the timeline article in the Oregon Observer is a favorite of readers. All of us on the Tuesday crew had a great respect for Jerry and his knowledge of the Oregon community. After all, he lived and worked his entire life in Oregon. For my, for my part, I always appreciated our recollections from the past. Remember when, we'd say, and that would kick off another memory of something or someone we remembered from the past. Jerry never failed to remind us that it was time for a break at noon, recalling that at one time a noon whistle would blow. And even though Jerry is not there to remind us and there is no longer a noon whistle, we still often repeat Jerry's familiar reminder of the noon whistle today. Always one that took his work seriously, there were times when Jerry would come up with a clever quip that would bring us a laugh or a chuckle to the group. He had a wry sense of humor. And yes, we miss Jerry. From this point on, I'm just going to highlight just some of the projects that Jerry was involved in at the Historical Society and Museum. And putting this together, it's remarkable to see just all of the things that he was involved in. One was what we call the Flores Paulson Project. When Flores passed away, she left the contents of her house, along with a massive amount of historical articles and documentation, to the Historical Society. Many hours, many days, and even weeks were spent sorting through the rooms of her home for items significant to the history of Oregon. The effort continues to this day as we go through items we brought back to the museum to be researched. Another major project was the Oregon book. Um, it was undertaken by the Oregon Area Historical Society in conjunction with Arcadia Printing. Jerry, along with Melanie, Dixie, Ann Morris, myself, were primary authors of the book. It presented a pictorial history of Oregon during the years from 1841 to 1941, and Jerry wrote the book's introduction, the chapter, and helped assembling other photos and captions for the book. Shown here and mentioned before, Jerry compiled, compiled the timeline for the Oregon Observer a job that he did for over 10 years. Jerry was also the Historical Society's representative on the Senior Center's Council on Aging. He participated in Oregon's National Night Out event, and he also led museum tours for the fourth grade students. Jerry did, acted as our treasurer at the annual pie and ice cream social. And this is a fun event. We love trying on the many variety of hats found at the museum. And with our abundance of vintage hats, Jerry, Ann Morris, and I gave a presentation for the residents of the Oregon Manor. Residents enjoyed recalling the days when hats were, re were a required accessory for many occasions. Summer fest parades were one of the ways we made people aware of the historical society and of our museum. Also, Jerry led the first historic downtown Oregon walking tour. The tour pointed out several of the downtown Oregon business establishments and some of their history. Jerry helped with setting up many of the displays and exhibits and is shown here with Dave Gasner on an agricultural article. Another event was the cemetery tours. The one at Prairie Mound Cemetery is shown here where we sought out different individuals with a history in Oregon and delivered a short story of that person's life and significance, dressed up as the, that particular person. Jerry also participated in the Oregon Chamber of Commerce Spring Expo with a display, another opportunity to put our name and mission out in front in the community. In summary, Jerry will always be remembered by a grateful Oregon Area Historical Society and Museum. Thank you. All right. Do we have any questions? Questions? 
questions for any of the presenters. Something saying that the only uh, like you, like Starquist is obviously looking for a different building or area. Uh, yeah, so the question was um, Is the Historical Society looking for a new location? And I will pass that to Joel. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the board has been working for a year or, or two um, looking for another site. Um, we have two stories of the building open to the public and you can see if you come into the library that we're pretty much bursting at the seams. On top of that, we have a third floor attic of storage and we have a storage unit here in town. We don't have enough room to do, do and display everything that we would like to display. So we're looking, we've been looking, we're considering any number of spots. Uh, we get an idea that this one would be ideal and then we find that there's some snafu with trying to get that. Uh, so it's a work in progress, yeah. And uh, if you have a building that you'd like to deed over to us, like <laughs> Lars Paulson did uh, several years ago, we'll sit down and talk business, won't we? I, I don't know if anybody's ever considered a dirt, uh, what the heck is that street? I go down by Green Kitchens. Oh, On the corner there, uh -huh. there's a building at 20,000 right. square foot. Oh, and it, it's been, as far as I know, it's still up the least. Well, at 20,000 square feet, we can expand ourselves quite a bit. Because uh, uh, we're at about 5,000 in display area now, or, or maybe not. Brown, that's on Brown Road. Okay, so we'll have, we'll have our committee make note of that. The committee person is here tonight. No, we always thought, yeah. why hasn't anybody picked up? <laughs> It's on North Market Street and Braun Road yep. on the corner. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions for any of the presenters? Yeah, yeah. There's a little part right there. I have a question. We live on Liddell, or is it Clay? Liddell. Where did the name come from? Well, <coughs> Joanne would have to answer that. Liddell <laughs> Street is a combination of the names of Cletus Brown and his wife, Adele. Mm -hmm. Cletus Brown was the barber here in Oregon for many, many years. So they combined the two names and you have Cletus. Google Maps calls it Cletus. 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 Any other questions? I just have one comment and that was Joan, did you? Anything about um, the going using the library as a school? I went to first grade in the library. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That would in have been when it was hall. in the village hall. Yes. Yeah. First, first grade was there. Mrs. Olson right, was a teacher. Mrs. Smith was a teacher. Yes. I don't know how long it was there. It was there for a couple of years. Right. And the library was across the hall from our two classrooms. Right, but I went in the library and we have to, okay. we have everything was in a box and we have to put it on the cart in the library if you open oh. you push it out to the hall. And You're younger than I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> but you were there too. It's yes. amazing. And so was I. So it, it lasted for quite a while. Yeah. Until yeah. they file. built that new. Mm -hmm. The file is about that thick of uh -huh. uh, documents that we've accumulated. Let me make one uh, almost of a clarification because I had said that Floris uh, Paulson said in 1920 a scarlet fever epidemic had, we had to burn books if we had them at home. And uh, being a historian and the library staff was very interested in where that comment came from. Um, the best that we can figure is that Flores's mother, um, 
Mona, Mona Hannon Paulson had been on the library board for 53 years. And Flores and her mother lived together and did an awful lot together. And some of us are, are surmising that that could have been oral comment from her mother, oral history. So when, when we were working on this presentation, Kara did a little more research and found that has, um, schools and libraries and other public facilities were closed in various communities around Wisconsin in both the um, scarlet fever epidemic and in the swine flu or uh, Spanish flu the influenza around World War I. It seemed like a lot of communities did something, but we've not found the actual document that says burning books. It is in Flores Paulson's book, A Walk Back in History. Mm -hmm. Interesting, I contacted our former director, Melanie Woodworth. She's been gone for two years, and I asked her about that, and she said it's in the second column on the first page. <laughs> and I think she could have almost said it's about the same line out from the top of the page, but she got it right on spot, and that's where it is. And so on the basis of that, uh, I retained that bit of information, but then modified it with what Kara's research had come forth with as well. We're still looking for that citation. We sure are. And that file is that thick, so we're still going to go through it. So. Any other questions? All right, well, it is 7.35. <laughs> we kept well to our timeline. Um, there are some brochures from the past Miss Oregon um, pageants here. Um, we have a brochure up at the front about the Historical Society. Uh, and feel free to chat and enjoy this lovely evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming.